Up until now, we've been looking at male competition and female choice, but is this really a male and female thing? So if you go back to the original argument that I used when I was talking about sexual asymmetry, it was an argument about energy and risk, not really anything specific about males and females except those tended to relate to the energy and risk. But what if males incurred a higher cost than females? What if there were species in which that was true? Then we could actually test, right? We could test whether it's male-female or whether it's energy risk. So for example, there's a group of fish called pipefish. So these are relatives of seahorses. And this is two species of fish within the teleost group. In pipefish, females lay eggs in a pouch that the male has. So then the male carries the eggs around for a while and the female can go off and do whatever. And in fact, in some of these species, the males actually have a pseudoplacenta, so a series of blood vessels that actually supply nutrients to the eggs that are in the pouch. And so in this case, in pipefish, males now make the larger investment, right? They're the ones providing nutrients to the eggs. They're the ones big and fat and having a hard time escaping from predators. And it turns out in pipefish, males turn out to be the choosy gender. So females will come to males and attempt to mate with those males and lay their eggs in the males' pouches, and the males choose between different females. And in, in a couple species of pipefish, we actually see females being the brightly colored sex and males being the more disguised camouflage of the two sexes. So in a situation in which the cost energy risk is reversed, we actually see the behaviors and physical traits reversed. Here are a couple more examples. This is the giant water bug here. The things on the back of this male are eggs. So the females lay their eggs on the backs of the males. The males then move around, they stay near the surface, and they aerate the eggs by moving around so that fresh water can flow to the eggs so they can get oxygen. When the eggs are glued onto the male, though, that glues the wing covers shut and is also heavy. So the males can't really swim very well anymore and they have to crawl around on the, on the plants. That makes them more prone to predation and it's more risk. So the mating event now has lots of risk for the male and incurs an energy cost. So we see in giant water bugs, the males are choosy and they require copulation prior to egg acceptance. And then after the female starts laying eggs, every once in a while the male will stop and mate with her again before she can continue laying eggs. So this is the sorts of behavior that we'd normally expect from females in terms of choosiness. In some vertebrates we see flipped role reversals like this. So this is the jacana, sometimes called a Jesus bird, because it looks like it's walking in water. It's actually walking the plants underneath. So in this species, females have territories, and in the territories they have four smaller males. The males are the ones who incubate the nests, and in fact, when a new female takes over a territory from a previous female, the first thing she does is walk around and destroy all the eggs, just like the lions and langurs did, but you can think of this as not sperm competition, but more like egg competition. But these female birds are acting just like the male mammals in a situation in which this is reversed. So the sexual asymmetry is better explained as an energy and risk thing rather than a male and female thing. It just happens to be that most of the time, females make the larger investment, so they end up being the choosy ones. Most of the time, males make the smaller investment they're the ones who have their fitness maximized by the number of matings. Usually males have more intrasexual selection, females have more intersexual selection, but not always. There are these counterexamples. So these different sexual selection pressures lead to gender differences arising, leading to something called sexual dimorphism. This is when the two sexes look different from each other, right? So sexual die for two, morphism for shape, so two different shapes for organisms. So lions, the males have the big manes, pheasants are brightly colored. In deer, the big antlers are on the males. This is a frigate bird. The big puffed up part is for the males. Females don't have that. So when we see sexual dimorphism, that's a strong prediction of the presence of sexual selection having occurred. And as we've seen a number of examples, these distinct selection pressures also create a tension and there's an ongoing selective competition between the two sexes or genders, creating an arms race where, for example, Sperm gets more and more toxic. Females get more and more selective about which ones they choose. Or males' tails get longer and longer. Females' preferences get stronger and stronger. There's a kind of a selection back and forth where these species are no longer evolving against other species. They're evolving against other members of their own species. And this can involve positive feedback and sexual selection can get to the point where viability or fecundity selection reigns it in. Right? These guys are probably 
to the point at which the antlers are about as big as you can get and still run through a forest. These guys are probably to the point where they're about as big as they can get, where this doesn't burst and pop when it just bumps against a stick. So you can get these very extreme features in organisms that are maybe not good for viability or fecundity selection, but they're pushed to that point by sexual selection. So we saw that gender matters less than the time and energy investment, right? So we have these examples. So what other selective forces can favor certain mating systems? Because we've seen mating systems like polygamy or monogamy or territories. But if you think about it, a natural question is then how does a population go from one state to another? If we have a variety of different mating systems now, that must mean that mating systems can change. So how can that possibly be? So let's think about the following kind of hypothetical example here. Imagine that there's a population here, a species, and the environment is benign, right? So it's a good environment, lots of food, weather is good. So polygyny can evolve. Polygyny is when there's one male with multiple females. It's a form of polygamy, the other one being polyandry, where you have one female with multiple males. So in a benign environment, because a female can raise an offspring all by itself, males can mate with multiple females. Each female raises the offspring, there's plenty of food, offspring all survive. If the environment changes to become harsher, then if there is variation in the behaviors where maybe there are some males that actually stay with the same female, whereas most of the other males mate with a female and leave, well, the ones that stay and provide food, maybe their offspring are actually able to survive much better because the environment is harsh and it takes two parents to provide enough food for the offspring to have a really good chance of survival. When that occurs, that creates selection favoring monogamy. So when the environment changes, you can imagine a shift from polygyny to monogamy. And then in this harsh environment, monogamy evolves. Now if the environment starts getting better again, right? so there's more food, maybe the mating season lasts longer, the spring and summer is a longer period of the year, now you can imagine a trait called double clutching can evolve. Double clutching is when a monogamous pair has an early and a late reproduction. Right? So they have eggs in a nest early, they fledge in the middle of the summer, and then a summer nest, and then the fledging occurs in the spring. That double clutching would allow that couple to potentially double their reproduction. Individuals that double clutched might be selected and do better than individuals that single clutched. That then creates selection for double clutching behavior. And in double clutching behavior, this is males now able to mate more than once, and females able to mate more than once, sets up a situation where maybe males and females mate, and then the female leaves the nest the male stays and takes care of the eggs, and then the female can go mate with another male. She's evolved the ability to mate more than once a year. And so maybe you could have a switch, if the environment becomes benign, to polyandry, where these females mate with more than one male. So environmental change is one very plausible way in which we can have these mating systems change. Now, most often we end up with the sexual asymmetry that is uh, the most common, where males competing and females being choosy. Polygyny is more common than polyandry. But environments change all the time. You have things evolving all the time. And that leads to the diversity of different mating systems that we see in nature. Organisms can also actually even change their sex or gender within their own lifetimes. So you get a whole different set of mating systems. For example, in systems with territories, Right, so organism has evolved having territories. Being a female would be better for small individuals because they're too small to have a territory, but a small individual could be in someone else's territory and they could get the mating that comes with being in somebody else's territory. Being a male would be better for a larger individual. Right? So larger individuals are the ones who can maintain territories and then they can actually mate more than once because they get to mate with each of the females in those territories. So if we think about, okay, small individuals are probably best off being females, large individuals are probably best off being males, this creates a situation in which a mutation that allowed an individual to start off female, and then at a certain point in its development change into a male, that would be advantageous. They would go from having these guaranteed single sets of eggs to having a territory with more than one set. So this actually creates a situation in which protogeny can evolve. So protogenous individuals, females, grow up to be males. So an example of this is cleaner wrasse in Australia. There's a territory. In this territory, one large male controls the territory with females. If that male is removed, we actually see the largest female changes gender and actually, in a matter of just hours, changes into a male, takes over, 
maintains the territory and in short order starts mating with the other females that were there previously. So it doesn't actually take long for this gender or sex switching to occur in um, the cleaner RAS. This can go the other way as well. So in systems that have a large female investment, right, so for example, a species where large numbers of eggs are laid, male would be the better sex for small individuals because they can't actually afford to be a female, right? A small individual doesn't have the energy reserve to lay a huge number of eggs. But maybe a, a male, a small male, would have a chance to impregnate or fertilize a set of eggs. Female would be better for the large individuals because they would be able to guarantee a large mating as opposed to having to compete with a bunch of other males here. So in situations where there's a very, very large female investment, this sets up a situation in which individuals can evolve to be protandrous, where males grow up to be females. An example of this comes from clownfish. So in clownfish, they live in groups of one large female, one resident male, and a number of genderless juveniles. So these juveniles are not really acting like males or females. If the female dies, then that resident male will change into the female, because he's larger than juveniles, and then the largest of the juveniles, they'll kind of compete with each other, and the largest one will become the new male, and that will be the new mating system. If Pixar had been biologically accurate with Finding Nemo, at the beginning of that movie, that female that we don't ever see lays a ton of eggs and then gets killed, what would have happened, if we're being biologically accurate about that, is that Marlin would have changed into a female, Nemo, as a juvenile, would have changed into the male, and then they would have mated with each other but that's probably a little bit too much for Pixar and Disney to, to deal with, so they gave them a different sort of behavior entirely. Another kind of example to look at is if mates are rare, um, there's little male-male competition or female choice, right? So we've been assuming that females can always find a selection of males to mate with, or we've been assuming that when a male finds a female, there are other males around that he has to compete with. In some species, this isn't the case. So barnacles, um, they start off their life kind of free-floating, planktonic. And they're crustaceans, though, so when they land and implant in the surface, they build their shell and their little crustacean living inside. If you live your life like this, and you're an internal fertilizer, which is what cr these crustaceans are, say this is a male, but all the other neighbors around are also male. He can't move, because he's glued himself to the surface. Well, if the closest female is over here, then maybe this male will have to, like, stretch all the way over there, and in fact, that's what we see. So this is the penis of a barnacle. And so in barnacles, we actually have the largest penis to body size ratio because they end up spread out like this, and the mates are rare, so you can evolve this large penis here. There's also some species in which there's a parasitic male where males, while still in this stage, will actually implant themselves into females and lose most of the rest of their body and just basically plug themselves in and become sperm production organs almost on those females. These adaptations are arising because the organisms are spread out. There's not necessarily a bunch of competition. If the barnacles are really rare, like they're just scattered in different parts of a whale, then a male implanting in a female, he may never see another female in his entire kind of planktonic voyage through the ocean if he sees one it's selected to be advantageous to commit to that one female. And that female will be selected to accept that male because she may, may never see another male herself. And females that resist this would perhaps never mate and not do as well as females that accept males.